mountains tremble Did you hear the oceans roar When the people rose to sing of Jesus Christ the risen one Did you feel the did you hear the singers roar when the lost began to sing of Jesus Christ, the saving one? You're the saving one. We can see, we can see.
Good to see you today. Those of you who are with us in person, we're grateful that you're here. Those of you who are with us virtually, we are excited that we are still one in the Lord. And so thank you, thank you, thank you for being with us. We're a congregation seeking Christ and sharing his love. I want to ask you to do one thing right now, and then we're going to have some other things later in our service. But if you've got your Bibles, get them open to John chapter 1. We're going to come to that in a few moments, but I just want you to be ready. John chapter 1. Our call to worship this morning comes from the prophet Isaiah. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let us worship our God. Jesus, Jesus, precious Lord, and none on the earth or heavens above that I have found more, more beautiful. You are my treasure, my great reward. Let's sing that again. Jesus, 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 precious Lord, none on the earth or heavens above that I
We're so glad you're here with us today and you're with us online. If you are here and you have a connection card, fill it out, leave it right in your seat. You can put your ties and your offerings right in it. If you're watching at home, fill out your connection card so we can connect with you. There's lots of cool stuff coming in the new year and new master classes. So there'll be lots of emails and things to get connected with. And you can also submit your tithes and your offerings right here on the connection card, or you can text to give. I say this new year, you can try it. I promise it's great. 530-LOVE, which is 530-5683. It's just a text. You put that in your text message, the word give and the amount. Once you hit submit, it will sign you up and you can, um, it will save your information forever. So have a great Sunday. Thanks, Rebecca. Okay, great stuff uh, coming for us. And it is a great time <clears throat> as we prepare for a new year to uh, go back to your Better Tomorrow journal. If you have completed one and you want another, just let us know. We can get it to you. If you haven't seen this, let us know. You can let us know in your connection card and we'll get one to you. It's just a great opportunity for body, mind, and spirit to be able to be together uh, in sort of growing in our faith and, and in our understanding. So in this slide, <clears throat> next week, not this week, but next week, we're going to have three master classes and they're going to hit all three of those categories, mind, body, and spirit. So the first is on Monday, January the 4th, uh, there's going to be a master class on how to read the Bible. These are all virtual. They're all from 7 to 8 uh, in the evening. So it's going to be how to read the Bible. Joel Phillips is going to lead that. So that's going to work on our heart, right? So here is the next on Wednesday, January the 6th. There's going to be a master class on setting goals for the new year, and that's going to be taught by Mark Fulton. Mark's an elder in our church and is, uh, has been a professional business coach for years and years. He's coached me for years. He is just absolutely excellent. So that's going to be a great opportunity on really sort of how to, how to, how to work on our life, right? Setting goals for the new year. And then on Thursday, January the 7th, we're going to have a master class on breaking old habits with George Pratt. So George is going to fix our minds. So we got all three of those bases covered in those master classes. Please let us know that you're interested, but just you can, you can just come. And so that's great. A week from now, they're all virtual. Our women's Bible studies are kicking off again a week from now. Wednesday the 6th is going to be, uh, they're both, both these studies are going to be on Ezekiel. It's going to be at 9.30 in the morning on Wednesday the 6th and on Thursday the 7th at 7 p.m. And you can just let us know you're interested in that with the connection card. And then I want you to put on your calendar a great event. Uh, it's going to be Lead Like King. We do this every year. It's going to be a great gala. This year it's going to be virtual, $25. Those funds go to support uh, scholarships for uh, seminary students. It's sponsored by the Urban Renewal Center and Jake's Divinity School. So please, please, we want you to be part of it. It's going to be great entertainment, great music, awards, all kinds of things. And I think Anna Post, you said Shirley Caesar is going to do something with us as well. So super, super great. This is big stuff. Please be part of it. Now, got your Bibles. John chapter 1. Now, it's, it's interesting to me in, in this season of Christmas that we often say that there are only two birth narratives in, uh, in the Gospels. You know, you remember that Mark starts with the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist. And then Matthew and Luke have actual birth narratives. Really, there's a third, and it's in the Gospel of John. It's the way John begins. The thing that happens is that John goes, instead of going to the birth of Jesus in, in Bethlehem, John goes all the way back before creation. And so it's a very mystical understanding, and it's just beautiful and powerful. I also find it interesting that um, in all four of the Gospels, the Gospels begin with the first character is John the Baptist. And... Um, we don't spend a lot of time on John the Baptist. And so I'm going to keep in that tradition and not talk about John the Baptist today. I'm just going to say I should. Uh, so somewhere along the way, we're going, to need to, we're going to need to spend some time with him. But today, John chapter 1, we're going to look at the first 14 verses. Listen for the word of the Lord. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. 
He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, nor a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. That was beautiful. Those are my friends, Maddie Hooper and Marissa Phillips, and that was just beautiful girls. Um, thank you so much. So good morning. I'm Hunter, and I work with our kids here at the church, and um, I had a, a very nice Christmas. I hope that you guys found some um, lovely pieces of of 2020 Christmas this year, and I kind of enjoyed the simplicity of it and um, the lower expectations and not having to be places and buy gifts for people that you wouldn't buy gifts for if you were in big crowds, and all of that was a big blessing to me. Um, but my favorite part of Christmas this year, and most years generally, um, is something that I do not reciprocate in, and so I apologize, but my favorite part of Christmas are Christmas cards, and I love every day coming home from work and seeing and everybody um, looking their most beautiful and just looking put together because I know we all look like that all the time. And here are some photos of, of some of my favorite families that um, you guys texted to me that we had lots of other photos, um, but these are some reflections of our church family. And it just started making me think how great family is. Family is just so great. I mean, families come in different colors. Families come in different sizes. Families, families are great. Some families have a mom and a dad. Some families have just a mom or just a dad. Um, they, come in all, they come in all shapes and sizes. Um, some kids are raised by their grandparents. Some kids are born out of their mom's belly. Some kids are chosen specifically to be with their family. And we call that adopted, which I think is so beautiful because when you're adopted and brought into a family, you are chosen. You are chosen to be with them. And that has always um, been such a beautiful concept to me. And, and I've been thinking about adoption um, with Jim's scriptures today. And I think about the fact that that's exactly what God did for us. God sent Jesus down to this earth so that we could be adopted into, our, into his family. And so I want to read these two scriptures that he um, read as part of the rest of them earlier. So chap, um, verses 2, 12 through 13. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to be children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decisions or husband's will, but born of God. 
So I think especially of families that have children um, who are adopted, that were p- picked especially, I think how they are a reflection of Christ's love for us and God's love for us and how he has chosen to adopt us into his family. And so I think about the benefits and the blessings that come from adoption, and I think about the fact that we get to be with God in heaven, that's one. We get to inherit his kingdom too. And if we're all adopted into Christ's kingdom and into God's family, then we get to be brought brothers and sisters of Christ, which is why I feel so connected to you and that having a family of faith like you guys is such a big, big blessing for me. And so all we have to do in return to get all of those blessings and to be brought into that um, family of God is to love him and to choose him. So um, I want to close this in prayer and then we will move on. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, Lord, and thank you for the privilege that we have had to slow down, Lord, and to celebrate the birth of your son, Jesus, and to know that you have chosen each and every one of us in this room and each and every one of us watching from our computers at home, that you have chosen us specifically to be adopted into your family of faith, Lord, and we are so blessed and we are so thankful and we are so privileged, Lord, that you have chosen us, Lord, and that gift that you have given us when you sent your son down to this earth to be born um, into a manger, Lord. We are so thankful for what that means, Lord. In your heavenly name, amen. All right. All right, Jim. I'm done. Different Christmas for everyone, right? It's uh, interesting to me. Uh, this Christmas Eve was the first Christmas Eve in three decades that um, I didn't work like 20 hours, and uh, it was it was it was great. <laughs> Though I missed everybody, uh, it w- it was great. I, I do remember as a kid, and I don't know if this resonates with you or not, but I remember as a kid that I'd get so excited about Christmas, 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 so 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 very excited. And did all the kind of the classic things, you know, trying to figure out what the presents were and unwrap them and see if you could get away with it ahead of time, all the stuff um, that bad kids did. Um, and, but Christmas night was absolutely the hardest night of the year for me. It was like, gosh, it's all over. It's just all over. And, uh, and I thought about that so many times. I've, I've read a number of times that, uh, that the suicide rate spikes on Christmas night. Uh, I've read a number of times that uh, alcohol consumption spikes on Christmas night, and it's not eggnog, but it's just straight bourbon. Um, I, I've, I've, I, I think for, for many of us, I, when, when our kids were real little, Adam was probably about three, and uh, I remember on, on Christmas night, he just looked up at me, and he had, everything had been done, it was a great day, and it was just quiet, and he looked up at me and he says, Dad, where's all the glory? There's a challenge in life. We put a lot of expectation on Christmas, right? I mean, you know, we we really do. We want it to be right. We want it to be perfect. We want to have what we call the the spirit of Christmas. We prepare things. We buy things. We plan things. And and, and when we think about that spirit of Christmas, we, we are all, no matter who we are, we're really kind of sucked into that, that smaltzy um, sort of fake nice that if we, can just, if we can just make a, a perfect Christmas, if we can do a perfect Christmas, if we can do a perfect Christmas, then everything's going to be right. And, and you just hear what I'm saying, because I'm, I'm, I'm listening to myself. If we can make it right, if we can do it right. And, and of course, we know as believers that that's the opposite of what Christmas is. Christmas is, is completely the idea of God's gift to us, right? Nothing that we did, nothing that we earned it, but that he gave to us. But we still buy into this sort of this small C, we just got to, if we do it right, then everything's going to be right, and there's going to be this. So in our master class last Monday, I was teaching on um, myths that Christians believe often about Christmas. And um, so I'm blowing apart all these things. And then at the end, uh, the last question Valina asked was this. She said, well, Jim, you know, now that you, she was a little more polite than this, but basically now that you've blown apart all that stuff, uh, what do you think the real value is of, of Christmas? What's for us as believers? What's the, what's, the, what's the value of the scriptures and the text about it and all? What's the, she was really asking, what's the real spirit of Christmas? And I, and I thought about that from Wednesday until um, Thursday evening. And then the Lord spoke into my life in a very clear way as I was seated at home 
worshiping with you uh, in this beautiful service. Our children's service was beautiful, and our traditional service was beautiful. And, and in the traditional service, there was a, a place where this, this incredible music and these hymns were being sung, these carols. And, um, and from O Come All You Faithful, there was a, a line that showed up at the bottom of the screen, and it said, Word in Flesh Appearing. And that's a line from the carol. And there were some faces of people singing. And I was drawn immediately to one particular face, that they were all beautiful. It was the face of a, a young mom, beatific face, singing beautifully. It's a young mom that I met not too many years ago while her son was dying. It's a young mom I met and watched in the midst of her son dying, her receive and accept and understand who Jesus is for the first time in her life. It's a mom that I've known to not only endure, but to find the glory of Jesus each and every day, even the hardest day of her life, where I and some of you were privileged to enter into that life that day. The definition for me of the spirit of Christmas is word in flesh appearing. The spirit of Christmas is a redeemed suffering. I think it's the theological import of, of pain and childbirth. You know, we're told that that's going to happen from, from, from the very beginning of the Bible. And, and I think there's something for us to, to understand that, that the goodness of God and the glory of God comes through, comes through that pain. And on the other side of it, we find something not only of goodness, but we find something of a deeper understanding. Not only a deeper understanding, but we find the presence of God. That's what the spirit of Christmas is for me. The Gospel of John does it in a beautiful way. So, you know, we, we have, we, I was mentioning earlier that, you know, we have these four Gospels, and they all kind of go at it differently, not only in the birth narratives, but, you know, in, in, in every way. So we call the first three the synoptic Gospels. You know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke meaning kind of an overview, a synopsis in a sense. And then we have John, which is the, kind of the odd one. Um, it's, it's different. It, it's, it's got stuff in it that you don't find in the other Gospels. It almost seems to, to see it well, it, well, let me put it this way. John sees it differently. So in, in, in the first three Gospels, for example, Jesus is always saying, you know, uh, don't say who I am, don't, don't go and tell anyone, don't let anybody know who I am. He doesn't claim his divinity until it, it really, in a sense, at the very, very end but in the Gospel of John, all the I am sayings are there, and they're throughout. You know, they're not just at a certain point. You know, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the good shepherd. I am the bread of life. I mean, he's, he's continually going around and saying these things that in the other Gospels it appeared that he didn't say. And so, so what's going on is that John just has different eyes. John, John sees things in a, in, in a different way. Um, I, when I have somebody that comes to me and they're, they're, uh, they're, they're investigating the faith, and they're not even sure that they believe, but they want to read the Bible, um, I, I don't know if this is right or wrong. This is just what Jim does. Um, if I give them a Bible, I will say to them, here's the first thing I'd like for you to do. Just read Philippians. It's a letter. It's just a letter to people. You don't have to make too much out of it. You don't have to study it. Just read it as a letter. And the reason I love that is because Philippians is, is, is a letter that begins with the deepest depression. Paul doesn't even want to be alive, he says. I know what it's like to struggle with depression. There's something meaningful to me. And yet in the midst of that, he begins in that depression and he gets within the second chapter, he gets, you know, he gets to this amazing crescendo of, of what faith and love and grace is. So I say, read that and then come back to me. And, and some people come back to me and I say, okay, here's the next thing I'd like for you to read. Read John. I know that the early church began with Mark. I know that John's the latter gospel. I, I get all of that. But, but, but when you open up John, there's just something. There's something because John sees things differently. He, he begins by saying, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And, and what, what John is doing is he's using this Greek word logos, which means more than word, but he's going back to before creation. And, and he's doing this amazing thing in the midst of this, and it's fun, and it's theological, and it's mysterious. But there's something else in it. He, he says, and Hunter mentioned this in her children's sermon, great children's sermon. He says this, he says, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. 
This is the story not just of, of the birth of Jesus. This is the story not only of, of, of Jesus' provenance. This is the story not only of, of Jesus' co-eternity, of, of, being, of being fully God. But this is the story of, of how he was fully human and how he draws us in to our being fully human, which means sinless when we're fully human. Paul does it in a different way. Paul talks about the last Adam, or we often call it the second Adam. And what Paul says is that, is that because the first Adam sinned, the first man sinned, now there needs to be another man who, who, who can redeem us from those sins. He says it explicitly in the fifth chapter of Romans. He also says it in 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, he says, since death came through a man, the first Adam, the resurrection from the dead comes from a man, the second Adam. This is who Jesus is. Now, Jesus is imbued with the Holy Spirit in order to do this, but, but we are born into this original sin, and when Jesus comes and is born into this world, and when he remains sinless, and it's, I know this is theological, but it's really important for us, then Jesus perfects life, and when life is perfected, we, 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 can, re, we can become sinless. I, I know that sounds bizarre, but, it, but, but it's absolutely what the scriptures say. So, so when, he, when he says to us, not only, not only that this is the first and the second Adam, but, but he says, for those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. He's inviting us into this. And so we find that the true spirit of Christmas is, is not a niceness for a day or even for a season, but it's a new identity. It's a new reality. And I love how in the 14th verse John says this, and we translate it, it's, it's, it's translated through the NIV as this, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. That, the Greek actually says this. It, it says, he pitched his tent. And I like that image. He's, he, 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 the word became flesh, he, he pitched his tent. Eugene Peterson in the message says this, he pitched his tent and moved into the neighborhood. And there's this idea that, that when God moves in, everything changes, the neighborhood is different because, because the neighborhood now has, has, a, has a new way of seeing. Well, really not a new way, but a redeemed old way of seeing. And John's eyesight, when you read the Gospel of John over and over and over throughout, John's eyesight is this. Everything he sees is glory. Not only on Christmas morning or Christmas Eve as we're anticipating it, not Christmas morning as we're experiencing it, but even on Christmas night and the day after and the day after and the day after. And it's, it's amazing for me because, because this, is, this is the key, right? This is the absolute key to living the spiritual life, is to see glory in the midst of everything, just like that beautiful image of this beautiful, beatific young mom who is singing from her heart, and I see the words inscribed below her life, word in flesh appearing. It's what enables us not only to make it through life, but it, but it, it, it enables us to, to celebrate life in the midst of all things. And here's something that I find that's so amazing in the Gospel of John, is that John really, for me, is the completely pro-life vision. <clears throat> now, what I mean by that is, that is that John sees the amazing beauty and glory in not only Jesus, but in every life that Jesus encounters. He sees it in every aspect and in every place. Charles Camosi has a, has a book um, called Resisting Throwaway Culture. And in it, he talks about how we've, we, we've really, we really have lived into a culture, we've created a culture that, that's a throwaway, right? I mean, I mean when I was a kid, um, I, can rem I could tell you in the little neighborhood I lived in, I could tell you where, where 10 or 15 uh, television repair shorts, shops were. I don't know if there's one in Hampton Roads. I'm sure there is. Somebody's going to point it out to me. Um, but, you know, it's just easier to discard it and start over, right? I mean, we do that continually. We, we say uh, it's a, what is it, a planned obsolescence, that there's this, all, all of that stuff. I mean, so we, we throw stuff away always. I mean, look, look, at, look at how, look at your recycle bin, if you recycle compared. We, we have a throwaway culture. I, I get that. But, but, but Camusi says it, that it goes further than that. It, it, it's the, the understanding we have about abortion, it's the understanding we have about, um, about uh, how we care for people who are in need. It's, 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 it's a throwaway culture in, 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 these, in these aspects, just the way we look at our marriages. It's, 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 there's so many pieces in this. Now, I say that not as judgment. I just say it as Kamosi's understanding of reality. Um, 
And then I think about the pandemic. And I think about all that's, all that's happened and happening in the midst of this, in the midst of this pandemic, the, the, things that have, the things that have changed. Um, I, uh, I uh, was, uh, was looking for some, uh, some supplies for Nest, our overflow homeless that we do here. We had 45 people sleeping in here last night. Um, and, uh, and so I, I started kind of Googling and trying to find, and somebody sent me a link. And, and you know what I found? I found that there's an entire industry in, in providing materials and supplies for prisons. I mean, it's an entire industry. And let me tell you what I found, is that the prices are outrageous. It's, I didn't go there to find the right prices. I mean, they are outrageous for the same things. And then I start to look at that and I start to think about, you know, here, here's, a, here, here's what we have with, with throwaway life. And, and not only do we, do we, can, can we easily discard people by just taking them away, but, but we, can, we can make money, we can profit off of that. And then you start to look at it and you don't have to read much to realize that you don't have to go far from that, from that industry with these outrageous prices that these prisons are buying and start to look at where the lobbying goes for stiffer sentencing and all of this is there. And you might say to me, that's political. And I accept that you might say that's political. But let me say this to you. The Bible talks about the, those who are in prison many, many, many more times than our Constitution does. Don't tell me that's just political. This is of Jesus. And when we start to profit off of these things, when, when I started going to Kenya uh, 15 years ago, <clears throat> I don't know if this is still the case, but 15 years ago when I was in Kenya, it was against the law to have a nursing home. It was against the law to have a nursing home. Why? Because the Kenyans saw that. Their family value was so exalted that the Kenyans saw that as the worst form of, of segregation, the worst form of abandonment to put people away. But look at what happened in COVID. Where was the first real outbreak when people started dying in groves? They were dying in nursing homes. And I'm not saying there's not, there, there, there are not times when there are need for, for, for retirement communities. I'm not saying there's not time where there are need for nursing homes. But when, but when we start to look at it and we start to look at, at the Medicare and the Medicaid and all that's going in and we start to realize it's a throwaway. People that we've cast and set aside. And then I think about COVID and then I think about the other things that happen in this. This is a simple one. I never thought about this till I was reading it last night. You realize that what's happened with COVID, you know, so, so um, I mean, here's, here's an example. Uh, our our daughter-in-law is expecting. And uh, Ross, our son, like would never miss an appointment, except he has to miss appointments now because he can't, he can't go. So, so when a mom delivers a baby in a hospital across the nation, it's estimated that she stays in the hospital between 24 and 48 hours less than she would if it weren't a COVID time. And then you start to think about postpartum. And there's a spike in postpartum depression, and it plays into so many ways. But part of that is, especially for first-time moms who, who, who you know, they're, 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 they're trying to learn how to nurse, they're trying to engage, they're trying to, they're trying to fit. And we don't know that that's what's happening, but it is. We start to think of this separation. We start to think of how, how we pull people away. We do it with our homeless. And we, we open this place and, and we say that, 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 that we're called to do it, and we are, and, and, and it's beautiful, and I'm so appreciative for so many of you who are doing so much with it. It's overwhelming to me. I was here not too many nights ago, and there was a visitor who was here, not connected to our church. And let me tell you, something as beautiful as it is, there's something that happens almost every single night that's horrible. And here's what it is. It's because we're only allowed by the health department to safely have 45 people in here. Almost every single night we turn people away. And I'm often one of those that has to close those doors, those glass doors while people look in. And we go inside. And so I'm doing that a few nights ago, and, and this visitor looked at me, and she, said, she says, you know, it's a shame how messed up people can make their lives, isn't it? I thought to myself, well, that's one way to look at it. 
And then I thought to myself, Lord, forgive me because I judged her just as she judged them. That You know the truth, and, and listen to this, because I think this is important for us. And please, please, please hear me. And, and I, I mean this in the absolute deepest love. Sometimes you can do the right thing for the wrong reasons. And I really believe it's probably worse than if you didn't do anything at all. When we pity people, when we blame them? What does John do? John sees the glory in them. John sees every single person sleeping on the floor or under a bush or in a shed or in a shack. He sees them all as the same beauty because, because, because this, because of this. To all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent or of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and he pitched his tent among us. What if the church were a tent? And what if the church moved into the neighborhood, not expected people to come to us, but what if the church moved into the neighborhood? What if the church was, was proclaiming a truth of not a small C nice, but a real redeeming of changed lives? What if we saw the glory in every single person, in every single place, in every single activity? What if we chose to see things differently? What would that do? What would that do for my life? What would it do for the people for whom I hold a grudge? What would it do for the people for whom I know I need forgiveness? What would it do for the people who I don't know and it is so easy just to objectify? What if the church were the tent that moved into the neighborhood and things were different? Will Willimon is a, a, a Methodist bishop. Uh, I've read most everything I think Willimon wrote has written, and um, he actually spoke here not too many years ago at our church. Um, he, he tells a story that I, one of my favorites of, uh, of him as a young, young Methodist pastor. He's in a little town, and he notices early on that there's a, there's a house next to the church that's really ramshackled, and the yard's never mowed, and the kids always seem to be half naked out playing in the yard or in the street, and, and you know, people start to tell him that the dad's just a drunk, and He's at least verbally abusive, if not physically abusive. And so Willimon decides, as this young Methodist pastor, he's just going to do, he's going to do the right thing. And he goes over to the house and he says, hey, Tom, you know, I, I'm Will, I'm the pastor, and I'd like to help you. I got some money in the deacon's fund. I'd like to be able to give you some money and I'd like to be able to help you sort things out. And, and, he, uh, and he says, you know, I'd, I'd like for, to help with your kids. So the youth pastor invites the kids to go on a, on a trip to the mountains and they go with the youth group and the women of the church go over and invite his wife to come to a women's gathering, and she comes, and, and Tom and his wife and the kids start coming to church. They come to church three, four weeks, and, and then Willimon just realizes they stop coming. He kind of forgets about it until maybe three months later, he runs into Tom in town, and, and, he, and he looks at him. He doesn't recognize him really to begin with. He's all cleaned up and standing tall and smiling. He says, Tom, so what in the world happened? And Tom looked at him, he says, oh, pastor, he says, I got Jesus. And he says, oh, you did? He says, yeah, I got Jesus. He says, he says it's just amazing. And he says, well, but Tom, I, you know, you, you stopped. We were so glad you were coming to church and we were helping you, but we were, we're sad you, you, you quit coming. He said, oh, no, pastor. He says, one day um, this, uh, this other church showed up at my doorstep. You know that fire and brimstone Baptist church across the tracks? He said, they, they showed up at my house. And, you know, they looked at me, and they looked me square in the eyes, and they said, Tom, you know what's going to happen to you? You're going to die and you're going to hell. That's just going to happen to you. And it's probably going to happen sooner than later. Is that what you want? I don't think that's what you want. Tom, you know what you want? You need Jesus. You know what you need to do? You need to get on your knees right now. He says, get down on your knees, Tom, and you're going to pray to Jesus. And he says, they told me to do it. I didn't know what else to do. I got down on my knees and started praying to Jesus. And then they reached out their hand to me and said, okay, Tom, come on up, brother. Welcome. And my life's been changed. I've been going there. It's been great. I mean, I said, I can't believe I got Jesus now and everything's different. 
And Willimon looked at him and he's just thinking about this sort of middle class, mainline church that he's serving. He says, Tom, he says, I just think that's so great. And he said, I'm just so sorry that our church didn't meet your needs. And Tom says, oh, pastor, don't worry about that. He said, here's the thing, don't feel bad. He says, your church gave me an aspirin, but what I needed was massive chemotherapy. I've thought of that story so many times because I've wondered how many aspirins I've given out. I wonder how many times I've just wanted to do the right thing and have the right Christmas. I wonder how many times we've just thought that if we were just good people, a good church, a healthy place, a place that invited, I wonder, and yet, no, I don't. Because I know there's something in us now that seeks the glory of God. That seeks it not just in our worship and not just in our experience as we gather, not in our friendships and our love and our community. There are you people are my life. I love you. You make my life complete. But it's when we look together and we see the glory of God, not only here, but when we see it on those who are on the floor, when we see it on those who feel as if they're estranged, we feel it, see it in those who feel nothing but shame and loss, the trauma of what they were born into, not what they caused for themselves. When we see that glory, when we love them as the Savior loves them, then the true spirit of Christmas is in us. A true spirit that doesn't shy away from the shame but redeems it. That doesn't shy away from the suffering but redeems it. That doesn't shy away from from the separation and all the judgment but seeks to redeem it. That's who we're called to be. And all we need to do is simply to see it. Is simply to wake up every morning and say, Lord, today I will see your glory. I will see your glory from the mountaintops and I will see your glory in the valleys. I will see your glory in the joys I have and I will see it in the pain that I feel. I will see your glory because it is you throughout it all. There's no place where I can be alone for you are with me, God Emmanuel. That's the Christmas gift. Let's see the world that way. And when we see it, just by seeing it that way, It's changed, not just in our vision, but in the vision of those. I have been in places in my life where I was so ashamed of myself and my actions that I could not look at someone in the eye. And thanks be to God, in every case, there's been someone in my life that has come to me and held my face up so that I couldn't miss their gaze. This is the church full on, nothing but glory. Isn't it a shame how people can mess up their lives? Yeah, it is, I know. But isn't it a glory when I see afresh again? Father, I thank you and praise you for this day. I thank you that that your word is true. I thank you that the word became flesh and pitched his tent in our lives and moved into the neighborhood. And we have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. And I pray, Lord, that you give me the same eyes to see nothing but glory. And I pray it for this, my family. In the beautiful name, amen. Move into a time of prayer. Um, I invite you to let us know you're here by uh, filling out your connection card. If you have a prayer request, you can uh, mark it there. Our elders, deacons, and prayer teams will pray over that. If you want it confidential, just mark that, and only Jim and Valina will see it. If you're worshiping online, there's a link above the live stream where you can fill out your connection card and share your prayers with us there. Um, Before I pray, I'd like to share a brief update about Nest. We have committed to host Nest until March 24th. 
The sign up on fpcnorfolk.org has been updated, so there's plenty of new opportunities to volunteer, to sign up. Um, please, if you're able to, check that out, share it with a friend, um, invite somebody to participate. There's also opportunities during the day to do things. We have a number of jobs that, that need to be done. Um, and this week especially uh, with Nest, it's a beautiful thing that we're able to host 45 people here every night. Um, but this week we're also hosting another church. So Christ the King Catholic Church and Larchmont United Methodists have been with us providing volunteers and food. Uh, and we hope to continue to do that throughout the weeks as we extend out to March 24th. Um, as we turn to, to prayer, we have uh, several uh, things we want to lift up this morning. Prayers for our world, prayers for Kenya and the children and families that will receive the boxes of love, prayers for Nest, for all of our volunteers, for our guests and the partnerships we have with other faith organizations around the city and with the city itself. Prayers of thanksgiving for Christmas and the joy of Jesus with us. Prayers for all of those who are traveling this holiday season. Prayers for those suffering from COVID and prayers for safety uh, for healthcare workers and first responders. We have several prayers for church family members, uh, Cordelia Baldwin, Kristen Lentz, and for Chrissy and Hank Thornburg upon the death of Chrissy's mother. The rose on our table this morning uh, celebrates the birth of Bennett Carey Dennis, born on December 19th to parents Jessica and Jordan Dennis. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we come before you today. We, we give you all praise and all glory and honor. We love you, Lord. We, we lift up your name. We ask especially that your hand of comfort and peace be upon those uh, this season who are, who are suffering and experiencing sorrow and loss, Lord. We thank you for the opportunities to serve in your kingdom as we, as we host Nest and, and at the Joy Village in Kenya and other ways that we are able to be your hands and your feet and your eyes and your ears in this broken world, Lord. I pray that you continue to bless us, to bless uh, each of the families here and, and our ministry and those worshiping at home. Be present in those spaces, Lord, today. And we pray today in a spirit of unity, Lord, as you taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, Lord, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come quickly. Father, a Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come quickly, your will be done the same.
the kingdom yours is the power yours is the glory forever amen yours is the kingdom yours is the power yours is the glory forever Christmas night, after everything was done and unwrapped and everybody was wiped out. And he looked up and he said, Dad, where's the glory? And I looked at him and I said, Adam, you are the glory. For yours is the kingdom, the power, the glory, forever. Amen. And a prayer I pray every day is that just as I saw it in the bright eyes of a three-year-old, I pray the Lord would purge me of my sin so that I might see the same glory in every face. If the Lord blesses that prayer, all will be well. For we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Merry Christmas, my friends. I'm not late in saying it. Merry Christmas every day. Open your eyes see nothing but glory. Amen, amen, amen. Yours is a kingdom. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory forever.
the power yours is the glory forever amen and yours is the kingdom yours is the power yours is the glory forever As you exit, 